Community Council lunchtime webinar series. Like many of you, we're working remotely these days, so we're using this time to reach out to our senior fellows, friends, and constituents to talk about the important issues in ethics and public life that are at the heart of the Council's work. So thank you all for taking this time to join us. Today's topic is ethical leadership in times of crisis. And our guest today is our good friend, Carnegie Council Senior Fellow, Jeff McCausland. Now, Jeff brings a distinct set of skills and experiences to the topic of ethics and leadership. And for me, he embodies the topic in both word and deed. Jeff is a West Point graduate. In his Army career, among his many accomplishments, he commanded a field artillery unit in operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And he also served on the National Security Council during the Kosovo crisis. Jeff holds a PhD from the Fletcher School and he's published and lectured widely at the service academies and war colleges, as well as colleges and universities around the world. And Jeff is currently a visiting professor at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Some of you may recognize Jeff as a military analyst for CBS News, where he appears frequently as an expert commentator on military affairs. And I'll just mention that I first met Jeff at a conference he hosted many years ago when he served as the Dean of the US Army War College. It was a memorable, memorable event in which I was first exposed to the intellectual and moral resources available to us through institutions like the War College and individuals like Jeff. And I've been a student ever since. Uh, now, before turning to Jeff, just a word about our format. We've asked Jeff to kick things off with a short presentation. After that, Jeff and I will have a dialogue and the back half of the program will be interactive. So please use the chat function to pose questions as we go. And our moderator, Alex Woodson, will read the questions on your behalf when we get to the second half of the program. So again, thanks all for joining us and over to you, Jeff. Well, thanks very much, Joel, for those uh, very, very uh, kind uh, remarks. I appreciate that very much. Through the miracles of Zoom, I'm now going to see if I can share those slides. I trust you all can see those at this point. Is that okay, everybody? Looks good. Okay. Uh, it's certainly great to be here and work with Joel and Carnegie. I had forgotten Joel exactly when we had met, so thanks very much for reminding me of that. And I should back at you and say uh, <laughs> that I have been a student of yours and a student of the great efforts by the Carnegie Council for now many, many years and treasure the fact that you offered me the opportunity to be a visiting fellow. And uh, here we have hopefully another opportunity for us to work together. Um, as Joel said, we're gonna to talk to you about this particular crisis and some of the ethical and leadership implications. I should say at the beginning, I've got a couple of things that I need to get off my chest. As I looked at my calendar, actually at this particular moment, I am supposed to be in Honolulu, Hawaii aboard the USS Arizona teaching a leadership workshop. So I was going to show up in a Hawaii shirt, but I decided against that uh, and uh, determined that I would spruce up my appearance, which has deteriorated as some of ours have while working at home. So I did shave and put on a jacket for the first time in several weeks. But uh, I apologize for the fact that I also need a haircut pretty bad. Um, I am a bit intimidated by the fact that I am following Ted Widmar, who spoke so well last week. Uh, so Joel put the bar pretty high for me and offering me this opportunity. And I've decided to use a couple of sides to hopefully stimulate your thinking and your eyes as we go along. So let's move on quickly. Um, it always seemed to me when you talk about leading during a crisis, you have to think about certain things. I kind of came up with my six uh, using the letter R uh, as a method to kind of uh, remember them perhaps. You have to reassure your team. I think that's very important because they'll be concerned about the organization's uh, safety as well as perhaps their own and their families. You have to react very quickly and making some very, very tough decisions. We all had to do that and run organizations as things shut down about six or seven weeks ago. You gotta think about resilience. How do we bounce back now and in the future? Look at your resources to include the time available. Start relearning and adapting more on that as we go along and pay close attention to what is really our reality. And I'll touch on that a bit more as we get into it. Uh, I think you have to keep in mind 
this particular symbol, which I like a lot, which is the Chinese symbol for the word crisis. And what Chinese do in written language is put together two symbols or more to create a new word. This word for crisis brings together two Chinese symbol. One is danger, that makes sense. And the other one is opportunity. And I think one thing leaders can do is think about it in those terms. What is the opportunity that is here? To quote Rahm Emanuel, former chief of staff to President Obama and mayor of Chicago, never waste a perfectly good crisis. Now that's not to underestimate, let's be candid from the onset, the sad amount of death, which now has exceeded all the people who were killed in the Vietnam War, as well as the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the serious economic dislocation for the nation, as well as individuals. But I still think if leaders think about the opportunity at hand, this will help them guide themselves into perhaps putting in effect those six R's I just mentioned. Historically, you might even think about the following. It's a fact that Sir Isaac Newton did a lot of his best work while quarantined with his family on his farm following a pandemic in Great Britain. He studied gravity and the groundwork for his laws of motion. Uh, in 1606, uh, Shakespeare isolated himself because of another plague and during that time wrote Lear, Macbeth, and Anthony and Cleopatra. And Pushkin in Russia wrote some of his most outstanding masterpieces while in quarantine for a cholera outbreak in 1830. He wrote the last two chapters of his verse to novel Eugene, Oregon, and several short stories, plays, and others. So I think thinking about a crisis as danger, obviously, and opportunity is important for leaders. I want to dispel a notion that I get sometime by using this quote by John Maxwell, who's written a great deal about leadership. Some people, I think, have the false belief that there are different aspects or different categories, if you will, leadership, depending on your profession. There's military leadership and there's business leadership. And frankly, I think that is false. As Maxwell says so eloquently here, leadership is leadership and leadership principles stand the test of time. They are irrefutable whether you're leading Hebrews in the Old Testament or a current, a current major corporation. And I, mean, I actually discussed that in greater detail in a book that I have coming out later this summer, using the Battle of Gettysburg as a case study to learn leadership. And we can talk about that more if you wish during a Q&A. I also think it's important for us to think about the following, you know, how do we define this thing called leadership? Uh, and if we Google the word leadership, goodness gracious, we'd get hundreds if not thousands of different definitions, some long, some short. Over my years of working on this, I decided I like this definition for the following reasons. First of all, as you can see, it's very concise. Leadership is the ability to decide what has to be done and then get people to want to do it. It's concise. Number two, it comes from what I would argue is a pretty doggone good leader. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, five-star general, commander of the largest uh, military operation for the United States, at least in the Second World War, uh, D-Day and the invasion of Normandy also the 34th president of the United States. You might not know, but Eisenhower also is an educator from the time he leaves the army until he becomes president, he will be the president of Columbia University in New York. So it comes from a pretty good leader, I think. And then last but not least, I like the last half of this, this definition, get people to want to do it. And that is certainly critical in a crisis because you might think, well, hey, if I'm a five-star general, President of Columbia, President of the United States, all I got to do is give orders and everybody's going to run off as fast as they can. What I think Eisenhower is suggesting to us very wisely is that you have to get buy in from people if you're going to get maximum for performance. You got to get them to buy into the direction that you want to take the organization. Again, very crucial during a time of a crisis. Now, I'm going to throw this question out to you real quick and then answer it myself. But is there anything missing from this definition? If Ike was on the call, might we question his particular definition? And I think we might. We might ask him the following question, you know, were these guys great leaders? And of course, you see Kim Jong-un, Joseph Stalin, that's Jim Jones, the, uh, the uh, uh, religious leader, took people to uh, South America, Adolf Hitler, uh, Osama bin Laden, and the gentleman in the lower right-hand corner is actually Paul Pott. Because if you took the definition, decide what has to be done and get people to want to do it, you'd have to say, hey, all these guys did that. Did they decide what they thought should be done? They did. 
Do they get people to want to do it? And in fact, in some cases, very enthusiastically, they did. Would anybody call them a great leader? I would hope not. And the reason is simply they are missing that one essential aspect, and that is character or integrity. As you see there, good old Norman Schwarzkopf, who I worked for in the Pentagon and was the commander during Desert Shield and Desert Storm, said, leadership's a combination of strategy and character, but if you must be without one, skip the, skip the strategy. Uh, in a talk that Schwarzkopf gave at West Point to cadets shortly after returning from the Gulf War, he talked for only about 20 minutes, and he said to them, there are two essential characteristics of leadership. And I think this applies again to any type of organization. First thing he said most fundamental was character because without character, there'll be no trust. People will not trust you. Therefore you'll not get max performance. They will not necessarily follow you, particularly back to a crisis when things are very difficult. And the second thing he argued for is competence. You have to be competent in what particular field that you are involved in whether you're a military officer or an educator or a business leader, because people want the organization to succeed. And therefore you have to understand the particular activity, profession or business that we're involved in. So character and competence are important. And again, to stress character, you see on the right where I say that people actually leave, they join a company, but they quit because of their boss. Sociologists actually call this idiosyncratic credits that you build up, it's a nice word or a very fancy word, I think, for trust that you spend during a crisis. I would even go so far as to say this, using these three people, leadership at the end of the day is character in action. <clears throat> the immediate test of character, but your credibility is built up over time and low stress, and you spend that during periods of high stress. A very good friend of mine, uh, a Chinese American educator in New York City, was a principal of a pre-K through five elementary school in Lower Manhattan. On September 11th, 2001, she had 1,500 kids in the building when the plane struck the World Trade Center. And she spent the next five days in that building until the last child was reunited with a member of the family. Her staff went above and beyond during that time. And I think it's because they had absolute trust and confidence in her build up over 10 years of working together. Some people use the words leadership and management interchangeably. I think that's a little bit imprecise. Certainly there is an overlap, but I think they are distinct. And as you can see here, management, I think, is all about work standards, resource allocation, organizational design, how you run complex institutions. History of study and management will take you back to right around the First World War with the creation of an MBA program at Harvard University. Leadership, as you see on the right there, I think it's more about vision, motivation, and that essential element, trust. Moving organizations in the future, dealing with change. Both are critical to the success of any organization. And frankly, in my work, the challenge I find for many leaders, regardless of the area that they're working in, is how they find time to think strategically. This is particularly difficult during a crisis. We are spending so much time taking care of the day-to-day -day tasks that present themselves to us. We're working long hours. We're very, very busy, but we don't, we don't necessarily think, is our being busy necessarily being productive? And we've got to spend some time where we step back and think, okay, we're getting through today, but what does this mean for us a week from now, a month from now, six months from now, and a year from now? When I worked for with General Shinseki a little bit, who was chief of staff of the army and then former director of the Veterans Administration. And Shinseki used to say, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. So during a crisis, the leaders got to take care of those immediate managerial tasks just to keep the organization going. I had to do it for the small organization I head up, but she's got, he or she's got to find that time to think about the future. Let me talk about a couple of these R's and then we'll go to a Q&A real quick. The first I want to talk about is resilience. How do you bounce back? when something adverse happens. And I think it has to do with all these things right here, innovation, empowerment, initiative, and accountability. Peter Drucker, a guy I like a great deal, has written an awful lot about management and leadership of complex organizations, uh, is looked on by many people as really one of the sages of the field of study, particularly in the area of management. And as you can see, he defined in innovation 
as change that brings on a new level of performance. And he talked about organizations innovating in terms of three different things, new products, new processes, and new organizational structures. Well, by default over the last six weeks, we have seen organizations innovating, certainly in terms of process, as how they do different things. Restaurants, which were all for sit down dining are now doing delivery. Organizations that had massive number of people working together in offices are now doing it by distance as we're doing right here. So some of this happens almost automatically as organizations adapt. And I think the key word here in resilience is adapt. I was fortunate before the pandemic in January to go with my <clears throat> youngest son and we spent uh, uh, two weeks in South America, spent a week on the Galapagos Islands, traveling around the various islands and studying the flora and the fauna and learning a lot more about Charles Darwin and his studies way back in the 19th century. And perhaps one of the most important things that I learned is that Charles Darwin did not say only the strong survive. You may hear that, but to tell you the truth, he never said that. What he said was that those who could adapt to a new environment survived and prospered. Those who could adapt, not necessarily the strongest, but I remember examining and being talked to by a naturalist about a small bird who over time developed a longer beak, which as the climate became more arid, allowed that particular bird species to, to, uh, to gather food from cacti with long spikes because it could get to the actual meat of the plant. So it adapted, even though it was very, very small, and it consequently endowed. So leaders have to think about innovation. That can only occur, I would argue, if you empower your organization and you encourage initiative, particularly during a crisis. Now, I've done this a couple of times. It's always great fun to stand in front of a corporate group and say, let me see a show of hands of all the people here in the room who are totally opposed to initiative and empowerment. And every time I say that, nobody raises their hand. It's amazing. Then I asked him the second question, what do you do to create a climate in your organization that encourages innovation and empowerment and initiative? And everybody's a bit stunned. Well, one thing you've got to do, I would argue, is this. You've got to think about accountability. The leader, particularly in a time of difficulty, who wants to unleash innovation, creativity, initiative in the organization, can certainly talk about it all they want to, but people will follow their actions. And as you can see here, you know, success has a thousand fathers, but failure is an orphan. And the search for someone to blame is always going to be successful. So at this particular time, it's critical for a leader who's trying to unleash that creativity in their team to do that while realizing that certain things are not going to go pretty well. And when it goes wrong, what happens? Do I take that particular member of my team out? Do I publicly, by Zoom or however, criticize them? Or do I basically say, you know, I'm the team leader, that one's on me. I'm a heat shield for the organization. The leader has got to be willing to accept accountability if she or he is going to set off initiative and innovation. You got to figure out what you're doing and, and when you should be doing it. And you also got to think as you're perhaps trying to be creative or trying to do new ideas, when those ideas aren't working out and shut them down as quickly as possible. It takes a decisive matter of choice and decision-making by the leader. The other R I'm going to talk about is reality. What is ours? You know, as I want, like to say, denial is not just a river in Egypt. And one of the classic examples of this is by this gentleman here, Admiral James Stockdale. James Stockdale was one of the longest held prisoners of war in North Vietnam in the infamous Hanoi Hilton. And later, when he returned to the United States, he became a professor and writer on philosophy at Stanford University. And he talked an awful lot about what became called the Stockdale Paradox. And he said, what got me through were the following paradox, that I knew they could control everything about what I did, what I wore, what I ate, what I got up, when I went to sleep, when I exercised, when I did not. They had full control over everything that I did except what I thought. So he said, what I had to do was retain a, a faith that I'm going to prevail in the end. I'm going to get out of this somehow, regardless of how horrible or difficult this is, I will, in fact, prevail and maintain that mental attitude, while at the same time confronting the most brutal facts of my current reality, whatever they might be. 
And he said those who perished or those who didn't make it through prison camp were those who said, okay, well, now it's April, but we're going to be home by Christmas. And then Christmas would come and they were still in the prison camp. And that basically just destroyed their, their intellectual support and foundation. So it's that paradox of absolute ironclad faith, I'm going to get through this and determination while understanding the most brutal facts of our current reality. And we have to be careful when we think about our reality, because too often times I find lately that we have a problem which has been described as motivated reasoning, which is a way of basically challenging the facts. In other words, if facts are presented to us that we find inconvenient or not fitting into our view of the future, we don't sit back and look at those facts logically, we just challenge the facts. And this is where emotion is, is triumphing over logic. And it's really the opposite of critical thinking when critical thinking is meant for you to look at things critically, dispassionately, and make your particular decision on what you're gonna do. <clears throat> In terms of that reality, I think one has to maintain what I'm calling realistic optimism. Leadership at the end of the day is what I call background music. Let me give you a historical example. This is one of the most famous photographs perhaps to come out of the Second World War. This is Dwight Eisenhower, 5th of June, 1944, somewhere in the south of France. He's talking to this group of paratroopers from the 101st Airborne Division. These young men are going to parachute into France in the early morning hours of the 6th of June, 1944. Sadly, a significant number of the young men in that photograph will be dead or wounded within 24 hours of left this photograph being taken. I had a chance to talk to that particular guy in the center, number 23. His name was Wally Strobel. He sadly has passed away. At the time, Wally Strobel was 22 years of age. And I asked, I asked, so I asked Wally, now I'd tell you the rest of the story, you know, what was going on there? And certainly Eisenhower spent the day on the 5th of June traveling around, talking to paratroopers, talking to sailors, talking about guys who were getting into landing ships, talking about aircraft crews. And the first question, of course, when I talked to Wally, as I said, was, was he telling you, you know, how to do squad tactics, how to read a map, how to jump out of an airplane? Obviously not. We're, we're far beyond all that. His mere presence that day on all those locations was to suggest to everybody he could talk to that this is going to work. This very complex operation is going to succeed. You see there what he said to his staff in March of 1944, we are going to focus on success. We're not going to focus on this being failed. But I went on, so tell me, Wally, what actually happened? And Wally kind of smiled and he said, well, first of all, you need to know that we were all in Quonset huts, checking our weapons, checking our parachutes. Some guys were reading, some guys were sleeping, some guys were gambling, some guys were writing a letter home, the normal type of things you might assume a young man might be doing at that particular moment. And a guy runs into Quonset hut and says, hey, General Eisenhower's outside. Now, truth be told, soldiers could care less about talking to generals. So we basically told that guy where he could go take General Eisenhower and they could collectively spend their eternity together. At which point, the guy who had run into the Quonset hut announces, well, you guys don't understand. He's got a dynamite-looking driver. So these guys had really come out to see Eisenhower's driver. Her name was Kay Summersby, and she was a female British soldier. They came out to see Kay. They could care less about Eisenhower. But be that as it may, I would still suggest that Eisenhower is there to provide that realistic optimism. I then went on and asked Wally, I said, well, what's Eisenhower saying? Is this one of those win one for the Gipper kind of speeches uh, that you think he might be delivering? He said, well, no, in reality, all Eisenhower had said to me was, son, where are you from? And I said, sir, I'm from Michigan. And he's saying, you know, there's great fishing in Michigan. But still, I would argue his mere presence was that desire to be background music, to be optimism. And Strobel told me as the aircraft he was on was taken off and he could look out of a small window on the side of the plane, the last person he saw before the aircraft took off was Dwight Eisenhower watching the planes take off, standing on the runway. But Eisenhower maintained that sort of realistic optimism, which all leaders have got to have. Got to have. Optimistic to an extent publicly, while at the same time being realistic, like Jim Stockdale. And Eisenhower carried in his pocket a memo that he wrote on the 5th of June, 1944. In that memo, back to accountability, he said, 
The landings on the beaches at Normandy have failed. Everything that I could ask of the soldiers, sailors, and airmen who conducted this operation was done. Any blame for its failure is mine and mine alone. And he wrote that and kept it in his wallet. And his enlisted aide found that about four or five months later, as I understand it, you can find that particular document in the National Archives. He was presenting realistic optimism while being willing to be accountable. Now that's not again uniquely military. I've seen examples of this in other fields. Two quick examples. You can look back to the 1992 NCAA East Regional Finals. Duke University is down by one point with 2.0 seconds to go to the University of Kentucky. Coach Mike, Coach Mike Krzyzewski calls his team to sidelines, that looks at them and says, well, we're going to win this game, and then tells them what they're going to do. And sure enough, Grant Hill th threw the ball to Christian Latner. Latner drops a two-pointer, and they win the game as the buzzer goes off. Realistic optimism. Ernest Shackleton, the British Ar Antarctic explorer, as the ship was being crushed by the ice, they realized they were not going to go home in that ship. He came into the tent where his men were at, had a cup of tea for each of them and said, well, I guess it's nothing else for us to do. It's just time to go home. And from then they got into a whale boat and made the perilous journey to escape the Antarctic. Realistic optimism is certainly what we're all about. So I'm going to wrap up here, perhaps with this particular uh, picture. I think it's an opportunity for us to rejoice and be a bit optimistic. We cannot obviously ignore the tragedy the pandemic has put on our country, other countries around the world, the, the death, destruction. But at the same time, our job as leaders is to keep hope alive. And as Winston Churchill so wisely said, we haven't come this far because we're all made of sugar candy. We've been through difficult times, certainly in my lifetime, certainly as a nation. We'll get through this. And don't forget, you know, being optimistic is, is infectious in an organization. You have optimistic people are happier and have less depression. Psychologists have proved that. They're healthier. They bounce back from illnesses more quickly. They're seen as better leaders, have strong relations, perform better under pressure, and are more successful. So I'm going to wrap up by saying I remain realistic, op realistically optimistic that we're going to get through this. And I am convinced I will get to Hawaii in the near future, and I'll get to conduct that workshop that I mentioned at the onset. With that, Joel, let me stop there, hey, and we'll go hey, to questions. Jeff, that was, that was great. I'm going to lead off with a couple of things here. There's so much to pick up on. Whoops. Um, yep. And thank you for reminding us of our kind of our stoic uh, roots and the uh, fact that stoicism is compatible with optimism right. and even idealism. I, I really like that. I want to come back to start off the conversation to um, your point about resilience. And this will tap into some of your, you know, sort of military history, but also political history. And it'll also bring you back to Hawaii for a second here, because, uh, <laughs> You know, when I think about American military history, uh, I think the United States military history, we have a history of getting off to what I would call charitably slow starts, um, whether it was Washington in the revolution or uh, even the War of 1812, the burning of the White House, uh, the Civil War and Bull Run, uh, World War I, if you look at the military history, the American entry was not smooth. Uh, and then that brings us up to Pearl Harbor. Uh, and then we could go on. But the point being, you know, this in, in you could um, one reading of the, the moment we're in now could be uh, hopefully if we take a hopeful view is that we're off to a slow start. Right. And that this is really just the first chapter in dealing with this pandemic. Uh, so uh, the start has been slow. But so what would you say to that in terms of your own view of leadership? in the way forward, whether it's at the national level or at the sort of more local level, if you're dealing with a leader of any organization, how to meet this moment? Yeah, well, I think first of all, you know, realistic optimism, the, org the organization, the team, whether it's a nation or the people that work at Carnegie Council will never be any more optimistic than their leader is. They may get to his or her level of leadership. They will rarely exceed that. So if a leader stands up in front of the organization, whichever organization might be, and goes, well, this is already awful. I don't know. We might get through this. Then again, we might not. I don't know. 
um, don't don't expect raging optimism to break out throughout the organization. That's just not going to happen. They, they need to have a plan. They need to know that you are thinking through uh, how to get from where we are to where we want to be. Uh, and here, a unity of effort is key. And one thing that worries me, back to that question of managed reality, is we seem to be breaking down into toward a, toward a two extremes. You know, the, on the one, and it's almost becoming an ideological question. You know, if you if you want to if you want to uh, end the quarantining, then you must be an extreme conservative and you know right wing and whatever whatever. And if you don't want to end the quarantine, you want people to stay home, then you must be a liberal, etc. And I think we're making a terrible error that our leaders have got to correct at all levels. This is not a question of ideology. This is a question of strategy. Everybody wants the same thing. Everybody wants the population to be as safe as they can be. Everybody wants the fewest number of people infected. Everybody wants the fewest number of people to die. Well, at the same time, we have to understand that the economy is very stressed and there are more and more people. When I read things that one out of five youngsters in the United States is having difficulty finding sufficient food to eat, that families are now in long lines to get free food. People are worried about paying rent and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, where is that balance which the leader has to provide by, by providing a particular strategy? And here I think, you know, back to Pearl Harbor for a minute, because I find that to be such an instructive time. At the start of World War II, to kind of tell us where we've been, the United States has the 17th largest army on the planet. The United States Army is the same size roughly as Portugal. <laughs> That's where we start out, okay? Right. And in a period of four years, we, we win the war in Europe and in, and in Japan, okay? That's called resilience. At Pearl Harbor, um, I always point out to people that every ship in Pearl Harbor that was bombed, severely damaged, or sunk, with the exception of the Arizona and the USS Oklahoma, Arizona, of course, we all know blew up, and a target ship, the USS Utah, which was a, which was a target anyway, every other ship that was damaged even badly, in some cases sunk, uh, by, by 1945 was back in the fight. Every ship was back in the fight. Every Japanese ship that was on the task force that attacked Pearl Harbor by 1945 was at the bottom of the Pacific. Okay, that's called bouncing back. And if you got all the admirals, this is where organizations I think need to learn and learn quickly and think through assumptions that were valid that are no longer valid. If you got, and I've tested this on senior naval officers and historians, and so far they've all agreed. If you got all the admirals in the United States Navy together on the morning of December 7th, 1941 in Washington for a nice breakfast at the Army Navy Club or someplace, and the CNO had said to that group of very, very experienced naval officers, when I say US Navy, what, what picture comes to your mind? What's our brand? What's the one thing that epitomizes our brand? Everybody I've spoken with agrees they would have thought of the battleship. The battleship is what we're all about. And at 7.55 in the morning in Honolulu on December 7th, 1941, that was true. By 10 o'clock in the morning on December 7th, 1941, that was no longer true. That was no longer true. And in the intervening few months, think about it, in April of 1942, about five months after Pearl Harbor, what happens? USS Hornet an aircraft carrier launches medium range army bombers from its decks to bomb Tokyo. That occurs in April of 1942. That's the Doolittle raid. Nobody had ever even thought about doing that or even tried to do that or even thought about any possibility of doing that until after Pearl Harbor. And then in June of 1942, the most important battle, the turning point of the war in the Pacific occurs, which is the Battle of Midway. And in that particular battle, battleships, no ship ever gets close enough to shoot it at another one. It's simply aircraft carrier against the aircraft carrier. Japanese lose four aircraft carriers, we lose one, turning point of the war. So much I hate to do this as a soldier to say the Navy can learn, in the period of five or six months, this is a classic example of an organization going through a crisis that forces incredible learning and resilience, the creation of new products, processes, and organizational structures that enhances their resilience. So Jeff, let me just jump in there too. There's another dimension um, that you didn't really get into that I think is um, implied in your, in your sort of formula, uh, which is really a listening. 
that, that the good leader, you know, in terms of what the inputs are. Um, and maybe you could just say a little bit more about that, because obviously leadership implies a, you know, a hierarchical, a kind of a vertical um, notion. Um, but my sense is um, in listening to you and in, and in reading about it, particularly in terms of the training from a military perspective, but also just leadership generally, that, that listening is such an important part, making sure that the leader is getting the right kind of input. Yeah, absolutely true. I mean, the, the one big thing about leading in a crisis uh, when you build up those idiosyncratic credits and trust, what that translates into, I always say in a moment of extreme crisis, like the building's on fire, something like goes on. Uh, people, you can tell who's in charge, doesn't matter how they're dressed, because everybody will look at them. And all they're waiting to do is to listen to what, what do you want me to do? Because the immediacy of circumstances, I'm ready to go. I trust you. Give me my direction. I'll do it. Okay. But more broadly, as you're working through the second and third order effects, obviously, of a crisis like this, listening becomes critically important. And we forget when we talk about communications, that communications includes listening. We often think that communications is me speaking and then waiting for a convenient moment for you to say something and I wait, wait quietly to respond. No, it's listening. Again, I'm a student of history. Ted Widmer probably knows this, would be amused that I used it from last week. But Lincoln once said, there's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth he was trying to tell us something that we should spend probably as much time listening as we do, as we do speaking. And I, I think this is particularly cr cr uh, critical if you're going to unleash initiative innovation within the organization. Uh, I was talking to a corporate leader and a mid-level manager uh, a few weeks ago, and the mid-level manager said, "One of my problems right now is my boss has Zoom meetings." But the Zoom meetings are large and they're all opportunities for him to tell us what he wants us to do. Well, that's not that's important. And you need to do those recurrently. And it's very important to set up a schedule to do that. He said, my problem is I can't get access to him to ask him questions about what I'm doing. And I haven't got I can't walk down the hallway and tap on his door. OK, or run into him at the water cooler. So one thing I suggested to a couple of organizations, now might be the time to create something you, Joel, as an academic, will be very familiar with. And that is office hours. Maybe every corporate exec ought to say, hey, listen, you know, on Tuesdays from 2.30 to 5, I am accessible. You can call me. You can email me. You can do whatever. I'll be doing, you know, standard administrative tasks, perhaps reading some email, reading something. But I'm available to you for you to individually contact me in that period of time just to keep those lines of communications that you're suggesting open. That's great. Hey, Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to Alex. We have a bunch of questions from the chat group. So, uh, Alex, can you tee those up for Jeff? Sure. Thanks, Thanks. Joel. Um, so I see a few about uh, Washington, D.C. Touched on this a little bit before, but I'll just put it very, very directly. This is from Bill Armbruster. Christopher McRae also had a similar question. How would you assess Trump's leadership during the pandemic? Well, um, I would not give the president high marks. I think he gave him, I think in one set of remarks, I thought they asked him to rate himself on a scale of one to 10. He awarded himself a 10. I wouldn't award him a 10 myself to say the least, okay? Um, I think what the president has missed out on, not to get terribly political about this, is two of the most important aspects of the office. Uh, one of the most important aspects of the, of the office is that the president is the great consoler. This is a, a responsibility that has been thrust upon presidents, and I think several of them have not realized how important this is until they got in office. One only needs to think about uh, back to recent memory, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, perhaps after the uh, Murrow building was bombed, uh, or Reagan after the Challenger exploded, or certainly George W. Bush. Uh, after 9-11, uh, or Barack Obama, who turns up in Charleston, South Carolina, after a white supremacist murders a bunch of people in the middle of a church. And they play that very important role of the great console, of the ability to show empathy to others and, and to heal which what are really, uh, really um, national wounds as well as individual or local wounds. And uh, I have not really seen Mr. Trump, frankly, exhibit that. 
perhaps it's just not in his tool set. I, I don't know. But uh, I have not really seen him spend any time talking about the impact of this particular crisis in terms of how it's impact individuals, in terms of people who have lost loved ones and those loved ones have died alone because you can't even do the thing that everybody wants to do in the final act when you lose a loved one. And that is be physically with them to console them. He seems to spend more time talking about the impact upon the economy. And I, I fear that may have more to do with his own personal reelection prospects uh, than any real outreach of empathy to the nation. And the second thing is, president is the great communicator. He has, as Theodore Roosevelt said, the bully pulpit, the bully pulpit. Everybody will pay attention to him. And at time of crisis, uh, this is a moment for the president to use that bully pulpit to be the unifier, to bring the nation together for common purpose. Hopefully a, a bit of that realistic optimism and a, and, a, and a clear strategy that doesn't make this an either or a proposition. Uh, and sadly, rather than being the great unifier and using that bully pulpit to enhance unity, sadly, it seems to me the president has spent more of his time using the bully pulpit and now all the other social media devices, of course, the Twitter being the classic, to divide the nation, to divide the nation and not use that particular power of the presidency to unify us towards common purpose. I mean, can one imagine Franklin Roosevelt using a fireside chat during the Second World War? to castigate his political enemies, as opposed to talking about bringing the nation together for common purpose for the depression or for World War II? Obviously, obviously not. Um, can anybody imagine uh, George W. Bush speaking from the Oval Office that he did so eloquently in the day after the attack on uh, New York City and using that as an opportunity to castigate his political opponents? I, I can't imagine that. So it seems to me those two things, the role of the great consoler and the role of the great unifier uh, using the bully pulpit is the things that I have found Mr. Trump uh, not doing um, that I think have been, um, to, you know, to the to the ad detriment of the nation. Thanks. Uh, so I'll go to Arum Satter now. Um, question is, what about truth telling? So much of what we hear from political leaders we know we cannot trust, while we also know that there are plenty who do believe what they hear. Given the polity feels broken or at least badly fractured, how do we come together and tackle our tremendous challenges? Yeah, that, that's that's uh, back to that thing I talked about before in terms of, you know, denial is not just a river in Egypt, you know. <laughs> and we had this problem of, you know, managed reality where people rather than take the what's presented to them and logically analyze it, will immediately attack the facts because the facts don't fit into the reality that I want and emotion triumphing over, over logic. Uh, and once again, this is where leaders have gotta be the one to lead the way and, and demand that we are basing our analysis in fact and not basing our analysis uh, in emotion. And furthermore, which really worries me is that we've kind of accepted a norm that leaders lie and lie regularly. Um, now, do have leaders in the past ever lied? Well, sure, no doubt about it. Sometimes I would say, and, and to hold them to an absolute standard where you say, well, you never lie, I think is, is not even a good idea either. I mean, in the uh, evening of the White House Correspondence Dinner, when President Obama goes to the White House Correspondence Dinner, I would trust if any news guy had stopped him and stuck a microphone in his face and said, Mr. President, is it true that a bunch of helicopters are flying to a place called Abbottabad right now to conduct a military operation to capture or kill Osama bin Laden, that Mr. Obama would have looked that person dead in the eye and said, that is totally, utterly untrue. Would he have been lying? Sure he would have. But he was doing it for a matter of national security as opposed to personal gain. And it worries me that I see leaders now doing it more and more for personal gain and even doing it on things that are trivial, just because for some other, some reason, whether it's their, their inability to divine truth from fiction, or because to admit they are, they are in fact, um, uh, admit something uh, shows their weakness because they were wrong. Whether it's taking a, taking a Sharpie and trying to show a map of where a hurricane might go, which is trivial, and why you need to do that is beyond me. Um, but uh, in doing so, we just slowly but surely 
as, if, as the, I think the questioner is pointing out, we sort of are standing away at the credibility and the trust we have in that person. And as I said before, at the onset, I firmly believe, and I would argue with anybody who wants to argue, that the fundamental bedrock of effective leadership is your character and your integrity. From that comes credibility and from trust. I trust you. But if I can't believe you, if I think everything you say is a lie, then there's no reason I would trust you. And consequently, there's no reason I would follow you. Great. Um, so first, I'll just have a comment on your answer to the question about Trump. This is from Nancy Jordan. Thank you for your perspective on Trump's leadership. I highly value it as it provides a wiser approach, an alternative to me yelling at my TV. <laughs> and I, oh, I well, agree tell, with that tell, as well. You know, quickly, you know, there, there is a time to yell at the TV. You know, venting and getting certain emotions out of the body is actually good physiologically. Great. <laughs> um, and this is from, sorry, I need to, this is from Hernan L. Villagran, I believe. I, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that name wrong. He had a couple of questions. Um, I'll try to com condense them into one. I, th I think his questions were getting at how can leaders communicate highly complex situations, scientific information, medical information, how can they connect that to the to their constituents, maybe at a time like this during the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. And obviously it's somewhat subject specific depending on the topic. But I think what a, and this kind of comes back to the first question. I think, I think one thing that all effective leaders need to be is self-aware, make an assessment of themselves, okay? I always tell people, you know, if you're really, don't ever send an email message when you're mad. Don't ever put sent. OK, if you're upset, you know, don't show it in public. As Colin Powell used to say, never let them see you sweat. If you get upset, well, you can throw something at your TV. Don't break the TV. It's expensive. Or you can go in your office, close the door, you know, cuss, kick the wastebasket, do, do whatever you're going to do. But, you know, get that out and then and then show show uh, show a, a face that is calm as you speak to a larger constituency, whether it's just your team or a larger group. The same goes in trying to convey complex issues. How do you do that? It's really an art form. You know, in many ways, you would have to go back perhaps to Ronald Reagan, who many people described as the great communicator, and Reagan really was. And one thing he could do was he could communicate very complex topics in a form that the average person understood. He could reach them, okay? It really is a skill. Uh, you can surround yourself with great speech writers. I work in the White House. Most presidents do that and depend upon them to help you in conveying those particular topics. Second of all, this is a matter of self-awareness and a bit of humility. And humility also is a very important, I think, leadership trait. It is what I would, we used to say in the Army, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane, okay? <clears throat> Don't talk about things if they're complex or technical or scientific that you obviously know very little to nothing about. Because if you do, you are walking down the path to disaster. And that's when you defer to the expert who's going to explain, is this particular drug a good idea or is drinking Lysol a great idea? I'm sorry, I had to put that in there. Um, because you're out of your lane. And there, there is no leader that is totally conversant on all the topics, particularly ones like we're kind of front of right now, which have implications of science, et cetera. And then finally, you gotta think through in terms of complexity, what's the second and third order effects? Because there are second and third order effects in terms of how you answer one question, which may affect another, another thing in the area of policy. Uh, as a leader, don't forget, as we used to again say in the Army, and I have to keep using that example, that an officer is always on parade. Everybody is watching what you say. If you're a national leader, keep in mind that national leaders all around the world are watching what you have to say and taking cues uh, from that. So you need to be very careful when you're talking about things that are complex, that you understand the second and third order effects, depend on your expertise, and make sure that you do it in a time period where you're calm and collected and can convey that kind of information well. 
Thank you. Uh, so this is from Tanya Kokar. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing that. Uh, she writes, I was hoping you could provide a few examples of women as effective leaders. During this oh, yeah. crisis, we are seeing how women heads of state in countries such as New Zealand and Germany have managed this crisis well. Any thoughts? Yeah, there's a whole bevy of knowledge that uh, has to say that, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be gratuitous to you, Tanya, that, that women may make better leaders than men do. Um, there is, uh, if you study, um, which I'm fascinated by, uh, some of the work with people like Daniel Goleman, who's written about emotional intelligence up at Yale University, and look at some of the things he's done. Great TED Talk. If you want a quick summary, just look up Goleman on TED Talks. Uh, the whole characteristic of emotional intelligence, many people now argue, is as important or even perhaps more important to a leader being successful than his or her, uh, her IQ because it has to do with some of the things I just talked about, self-awareness, the ability to control your emotions, the ability to have empathy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you took the words out of my mouth. If, if somebody said to me, from what you've seen so far, who are the most effective leaders that you have seen in this particular crisis? Well, here in the United States, I'd probably pick a couple of governors, governor of New York, California, Michigan, and perhaps Ohio. Um, um, would be my, my candidates at the moment. Uh, certainly internationally, I would agree with Tanya. I would put uh, Angela Merkel and the uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand at the very top of the list, who have been very clear, calm, have communicated well, have tried to unify the country um, in a very, very effective fashion. And the other person, oddly enough, that I might add to that list is Queen Elizabeth. If you want to read, listen to something inspiring, um, listen to the speech that was taped and sent by Queen Elizabeth to the country about the pandemic. And of course, she can hearken back to the fact that she was a young woman when her father who was king of England and communicated the same sort of effort to unify the nation uh, at the onset of the Second World War. Okay, uh, maybe time for one more question, Joel? Do you think? Okay. Uh, yes, Alex. Yeah, one more, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, and one, hey, Alex, we, and one thing, if you know, I'm going to pop up my um, email address here in a second when we get done. Um, and if anybody has a question they didn't get answered, if you send me an email, I'll endeavor to, to get back to you. Okay. So this is from Becky. Actually, sorry, I'm going to go with Edward Crook. He writes, for many companies, innovation, parentheses, experimentation is tied to the notion of leaders building safe spaces to fail. How do we reconcile safe spaces to fail with the message of optimism and hope? And put some parentheses, success is the only option. Yeah, I, th I think he's right. As I said before, it's a matter of accountability. So I got to be willing to be the heat shield for the organization to unlock innovation and move me into the future. And organizations are doing that right now. I am firmly convinced sadly, that a number of large organizations and small ones certainly are going to fail over the next several years. When they ultimately go out of existence, uh, they will look back to this pandemic as well as when the, if you will, the organization had a heart attack or a stroke and then has been in steady decline uh, ever since. But the history, even recent history of big organizations that did not adapt back to Darwin, Again, it's not the strongest that survives, it's the ones that adapt survive, ha have uh, failed to realize the change in the environment and, uh, and then fail. Think of, think of Eastman Kodak, who, who back in the 1990s at a board meeting decided that digital photography was a passing fancy and people would always like film. They're not around anymore. Think about BlackBerry that really had the market for cell phones at around about the year 2000. You don't think see Blockbuster or, or see Blackberry anymore. And I'm told, and I was there one time, it was still there, there is one Blockbuster store still left in the United States. It's in a small town in Oregon, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I was telling Joel the other day, um, so you have to examine the environment and start quickly changing. And I was inspired by this the other day, Joel and I were talking about it, so a quick metaphor. My daughter and I were sitting around, like most people are, one evening, trying to figure out what are we gonna do tonight? And we decided we'd watch a movie. And so she selected this movie, which I commend everybody, it's a great flick, called Free Solo, about this guy who climbs El Capitan without any ropes, okay? It's a gorgeous film, scenery's lovely, and it's a great story. 
Well, quickly, what does that have to do with anything? Well, to me, that's really what organizations are doing right now. Leaders of organization are free soloing. Suddenly this pandemic arrived, which is just like this vertical cliff at El Capitan, this guy climbed. What he did is instructive, and that is he spent several years and innumerable climbs climbing that cliff over and over, examining the environment he was going to have to have to go over. Every rock, to the point that by the time he climbed the cliff, he had memorized every handhold. Okay. So he's telling you you got to react to the environment, you got to learn from the environment and innovate. Now the, here's the bad news. We ain't got eight or nine years. We ain't got eight or nine years. You got to move on very, very quickly. Let me throw this up if I could one last time. I'm gonna throw up one more thing if I could. Oh, that ain't working. There we go. Bear with me one second. I'm sorry about that. All I was gonna do, Joel, and you can talk over this if you want. Here's my email address, folks. If anybody was unable to uh, get a question in, uh, send me an email to that email address. I'll be trying to answer it. And that's the uh, our new book that's coming out in August. Um, obviously, commend that to you. Back over to you, Joel. Yeah, Jeff. No, thank you very much. This is really a message we were hoping to hear. You know, uh, realism, <clears throat> optimism, and you know, not only resilience but uh, you know, the ability to adapt. And uh, you know, I think we're all we're all dealing with that now. And I'll just leave the audience with uh, just a an image that you uh, transmitted to me several years ago, uh, the course that you used to teach on leadership, um, leadership in four directions. Uh, it was really interesting to think about it in that way. You know, the idea that you, of course, you lead people that perhaps are um, subordinate in some way, but that there are other dimensions to leadership, uh, your, your peers, uh, but also this idea that you, you may lead your boss, uh, you know, uh, in, some, in some way and have some effect in that sense, somebody that may uh, be in some sort of superior position to you or have more power, but you have some influence there. But then also, also crucially, one that I had never thought of before was to lead yourself uh, and to be thinking in that way. So uh, thanks, a lot of that was wrapped up in this presentation today. I really wanna thank you for that, Jeff, and thanks for you know, being willing to, to, to answer questions beyond so people will be in touch with you by email. I just want to remind the audience that we have recorded the webinar, so it will be available on the Carnegie Council website. Uh, it'll also be available on our YouTube channel and we'll have some clips that you'll be able to refer to and to share. And uh, we'll convene again next week uh, at noontime on Wednesday. Our guest then will be uh, Wendell Wallach, who's a, a council senior fellow, and he'll be talking about um, global governance and emerging technologies. So thanks again, Jeff. Thanks to the audience for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Joel. Thanks, Alex. Bye-bye.